Ukraine, um, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things that um, we absolutely can talk about. There are things that I know about. It's just good to keep in mind that I'm not a substitute for clinical treatment, right? So if you have an issue that, that needs treatment, uh, you don't, don't come to me so that it's free. Uh, you know, actually seek out someone who's registered in a professional um, in Europe or, or Greece, where, wherever you're based. Um, the way I approach mental game coaching is not you kind of tell me some problems and then I tell you what to do and you go do that. Um, the way I approach mental game coaching is that we need to figure out what's best for you. And that can't be done with just me, right? That's done by us figuring it out together. Um, so, you know, you need to help yourself kind of figure out what the problem is and help yourself figure out what some of the solutions are. And I'm here to help facilitate that. So another way of putting that is that mental game coaching is a collaboration um, where we kind of reflect and explore what's going on with you um, in general. Uh, are there any questions about that? OK, that's fair enough. That's pretty straightforward. OK. Um, yeah, so one, one last thing about this, and then we'll move on to some stuff more directly related to poker. Uh, my training psychodynamic. Um, some people have heard like bad things about psychodynamic therapy because it, it you know, Freud, uh, I guess, psychodynamic therapy is very similar to what Freud started in terms of some of its underlying principles, but it's it's very backed by scientific evidence and it's evolved for a hundred years since since Freud. It basically just takes us an underlying assumption that we're not always we don't always understand everything that we do, right? Like there are some things that happen that are are driven by parts of us that we don't automatically understand, rather than us like always being totally rational um, people. And so uh, this type of therapy considers who you are as an entire person, including you know your memories, your family, how these things influence your perspective, how you know certain patterns of behavior have changed your the way you function, and uh, kind of understands all of those things together. I think that can be really important in poker, uh, as we'll talk about more. Um, I think a lot of the reason people tilt is not because they're losing money, right? Like everyone here, I think, is more or less comfortable um, losing some money. Um, I think often people tilt because it means something different to them. It has different like symbolic significance. There's a fear about being a failure, a fear about, um, I don't know, mo moving back in with your parents, disappointing somebody, um, disappointing yourself. And so that's like a kind of psychodynamic approach to understand what these things mean um, beneath the surface. Um, a more like behaviorist approach would just be like, oh, I don't know, you, you're you tilting because uh, it feels bad to lose, and so you've developed the bad habit of, of um, playing high variance to, to deal with it or something. It's like kind of more um, on the surface. Um, so some things that you might want to consider bringing to, group, or to mental game coaching one-on-one -on -one are what does success in poker look like to you? Um, uh, something we're going to talk about today and in mental game coaching is, is getting really specific with your goals. So I think a lot of people just think, I want to do well in poker, or I, I don't know, I, I want to get to an arbitrary uh, number of big blinds per hundred hands. But um, I think we should be more specific than that, right? Like we should look at what our ultimate goals are in poker, what our goals in the next month are with poker, what our goals are in the next six months. The more detailed you can make that type of map, the better off you're going to be. And there will be diminishing returns at some point on that detail, but it's like the same as having a CBET strategy. Like the more, um, at some point it's it's needlessly complicated, but up to a certain point, like it's good to know more and more and more about what poker success looks like for you. And then very separate from that, although it looks the same, is what does it mean to you? Why does this matter for you emotionally? Like why, why is this something that you care about? Why is it something you're fighting for? Like um, there are a lot of easier ways to make money than playing poker. Like everybody in this server is going to be smart. Everyone in the server is going to be driven and competitive. Everybody here could have been an accountant or better, right? So why is this what you're pursuing? And what does that success mean for you? Most people here are going to be competitive. What does competition mean for you? Okay, so those are some things to consider for yourself because they're going to help motivate you and they're going to help you understand what you're going through when you fail. Um, similar to the first question, what are your immediate goals? And what are your primary obstacles? So like I talk to a lot of people, friends, students who say, uh, I should study more, but I don't study enough. Well, what are the obstacles to studying? 
Like, you love to play, you want to get better. So what actually is getting in the way of you studying? And if you can answer that question for yourself, you have a much better chance of actually doing the thing that you've set out to do. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into some stuff that is more um, general and like kind of how to help your mental game in general. Um, these are all pretty solid pieces of advice, but uh, they're going to be different for each person. Um, they're going to be less and more important for different people. Um, I'm, I would imagine that most people in this group don't like have crazy rack tilt, right? So um, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily going to feel like it applies directly and fixes your life, but these are, these are some general things to consider. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Spiro says, um, you, you've been watching my face, but I am sharing my screen. You can see it on probably the far left of the, um, the kind of pictures of people's faces. Uh, like so. Everybody can see it now, I hope. Okay. There's this watch stream button or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we should be good now. Uh, okay, so this is, and actually it would be really important for everyone to look at, at this moment. Um, so this is called the yerkes dodson bell curve. Um, has anyone here seen this before? Okay, cool. I would have thought some, some people had seen this before. This is a very good poker idea. Um, so uh, there have been a number of studies that have been replicated that show that if you give somebody a task, like, I don't know, say every word that begins with the letter Y, or throw balls into this hoop, right? If the task uh, is a certain level of difficulty where it's effortless, like they just, it's just a boring task, they're just like pressing a button, um, people don't perform at their full potential. They don't, uh, they, they just tune out, they're, they're not all there, they're not focused, and they don't do very well. This is like the equivalent of working like a minimum wage job or something where you, you know, you don't, you don't perform very well. Um, but then if you increase the difficulty of the task a little bit, uh, maybe you increase the stakes in some way, you know, put money on the line, people's um, level of performance peaks. And it's peaking at the same time as their stress is peaking. I mean, stress physiologically, like, I mean, um, you know, maybe their heart rate is up, there are certain hormones that are being activated, um, they, they just kind of are tuned in. And then you can get to the other side of that, where maybe now if you add someone yelling at you and throwing sticks at you, your uh, level of anxiety and stress is so high that you can no longer function properly. So this is a really, really important idea for poker. Um, obviously, it's important in the sense that if you just kind of lose 25 buy-ins, maybe your um, level of stress is such that your performance is, is below the peak. But there's something else that I think is important to consider as well, which is that most people, when they enter a state of flow, one of the things that's happening is they're at the peak of this yerkes dodson curve. So if you, like, let's say you love music, and when you play improvised jazz, you just feel, like, totally alive and great. You're probably not going to enter a perfect state of flow, like, playing alone in your office, right? You're probably going to enter a perfect state of flow you know, on a stage with a crowd and four other guys and things are going on, but it's just a good night, like you're feeling right. And that's when you're in this perfect state of flow. So I can only speak for myself, but one of the reasons I love poker is that it can be such a challenge and such an interesting challenge and you're doing it, you know, for money, you're doing it with, with personal emo emotional goals. And when everything is right, I'm completely focused on that. Like, nothing really matters outside of, of that room, of, outside of what I'm doing at that moment. Nothing matters outside of figuring out this, this moment in this beautiful game that I love. So, I mean, I think everyone here loves poker, and I'm only capable of entering that state of flow because of this optimal level of stress. And that optimal level of stress is only possible because there's an ability to kind of end up on the far right side. 
because there's the capacity to get absolutely owned, to get really unlucky, to get crushed. And so next time you're going through like the, the worst beat of your life and you're just getting your ass kicked and you're really um, feeling horrible about yourself and thinking you hate poker, you should remember that you aren't able to kind of access this part of the game that you love without the potential to end up on this far right side, without the potential for the stress to be overwhelming. Um, without there being any stakes, you have no ability to enter a state of flow in the first place. So if, if all of us just did something for money that was like we just clicked the same button over and over again every day, and we made like our EV, but we made it exactly right every hour, like 45, 80, 90, whatever you make an hour, that's when you just click that button. I don't think anybody here would keep that job. Like, I think maybe you'd keep it for a couple of years, but I mean, we'd all find something else, right? So um, this, this kind of shows that it's, it's, it's the bad beats that are necessary um, and, and the failure and the mistakes that are necessary in order for us to actually love this thing in the first place. Um, this is a, a, fun, a meme that made me laugh. But um, yeah, so one other thing to consider is um, I think often people's bad, bad decisions arise from the distance between what they want to be true and what is true. So, you know, another way of describing this is fortune reversal. I personally have always been guilty of making very bad calls when the equity of my hand goes from like 90% to 20%. Right? Like, you know, you bet that bet, and then someone shoves 200 big blinds on the river. Uh, I just, I, I, I hate that feeling, and I just have a very hard time folding bottom set or whatever it is. Um, and for me, the reason for that is that the distance between what I want to be true and what is true is, is quite large. Right? And so just kind of keep this in mind. Whenever it's possible for that to be true, that's where the potential is highest for you to be playing your B game or your C game or your D game. Um, captain's typing. Um, okay, so one, one other way of thinking about stress and handling stress and remaining in that sort of peak level of... Um, of, of optimal arousal is uh, how we process stress. So this is another uh, framework that's been around for a long time, that's been backed by uh, evidence. And what this framework says is that when something happens, we hear like a growl in the bushes, or we get stacked, or someone calls and says, young man, I'm very disappointed in you. Um, the first thing we do is we figure out the relevance of the stimulus. So we determine whether or not it's actually something to think about at all or worry about. The next thing we do is we think about the implications. So we, we try to assess, uh, what does this mean? Does this mean that I might break my arm? Does this mean that I might get bitten by a bear? Does this mean that I might have to quit poker, right? We try to figure out what the implications of the stimulus are. And then we have our coping potential and normative significance. These two things are sort of similar. Normative significance just means what does this mean for my identity? What does this mean for how other people see me? What does this mean for my life as like a social human? Coping potential means what resources do I have to deal with the consequences of this stimulus? So um, another tip that I have, another thing that works for me is I try to remind myself that if somebody told me tomorrow that A, I'd lost every dollar I'd ever made playing poker, B, I could never make another dollar playing poker again, and C, every human being in my life knew that that happened and that was my fault, I would still be okay. Like, I would still be fine. I would just focus on other stuff in my life. I have people in my life that I love. I live in a, in a developed country. I'm, like, safe. Everything would be okay. But when I'm going through a really bad downswing, there's this distance between the reality of my coping potential and what feels like my coping potential. You know, being successful in poker is so important for me, both because I hate the idea of being seen as a failure and also because I love it, that I really, really, really don't want to imagine that type of worst case scenario. I really, I, I hate the idea of it, and I hate it so much that 
in my kind of subconscious before I really think through the math of it, I it feels more like life or death than it does like, you know, something that sucks and you move on from like within a week. Um, so I think you should kind of revisit this idea of what are the implications when you get hit with a massive downswing and what are your coping potentials and what does it mean for normative significance? If you can answer these questions for yourself in a way that feels like relaxed and rational and there's like a, a good plan behind every possible outcome, then these downswings are going to stop feeling like life or death and they're just going to start feeling like minor setbacks, right? Um, one really interesting thing, in fact, something that almost exclusively got me into mental game coaching is Phil Helmuth. Everybody just thinks Phil Helmuth has like a temper, right? And he's just kind of, I don't know, a child and, and, and that's it. And yeah, he is immature, but he talks about how when he was a kid, everybody in his life was more successful than him and he was a fuck up. Like he couldn't do well in school. He just felt like totally disrespected and ignored. And the only a avenue he had to success uh, to being recognized and respected by his siblings and his family was being good at games. That was the only way he could really earn love. And so for him, when he gets completely whacked at poker, he's not just losing money, he's losing this major part of his normative significance. This is so tied to his identity that losing is like dying for him. And that's why he flips out. Not everybody is going to, nobody really, hopefully, is going to have it as bad as Phil Helmuth, right? But we all have a little bit of this. Now, I, my dad was a, a really, really good chess player. My, my dad and I, we didn't have a lot to talk about um, most of the time. You know, I was really into the arts and whatever. Um, but I could play chess. And that was something we could talk about. And that was something where I feel respected. And I think that bleeds into poker. Like, that's part of what poker means to me. That's what gives me drive is I... I developed an appreciation for games from him, and I also think subconsciously beneath all of that, there's a way in which I'm earning part of my identity by being successful with it. Can anybody else relate to that in some way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help me, got a Yeah, well, you know, positive. We're actually going to talk a little bit about positivity because even though it might not work well for Helmuth, Helmuth is dealing with like the mother of all mental game problems, right? And it's not really his fault that he's in that situation, in a way. Like, this is something that uh, his, his life events sort of set him up for. But it's actually, you know, positivity can actually be quite helpful, even for people that are doing, uh, doing well. Um, like, that are not, not, that don't tilt it easily. Like, if you ever just feel bummed out with poker and stuff, we'll talk more about what positivity actually can kind of mean. And, um, and I think it's actually helpful for a lot of people. Um, yeah, yeah, that type of character is also responsible for a major drive in his career. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, no, totally. This is the thing about being really competitive, right? Like, I, I kind of skipped over this slide, but I mean, I love competition. I love it. And the only thing better than winning is winning for money. And then, of course, the only thing worse than losing is losing for money, right? So, like, we can't, like, I hate when I lose... I don't know, a game of basketball or just like a board game with friends. And like, you know, it's even more painful if it's like half of my rent for the month. So it's just, yeah, that's, that's just the reality of, of what we've signed up for. And it's okay to be aware of that, that losing sucks. Um, I, it doesn't have to be, like, I, I think a lot of people talk about this holy grail of, uh, oh, I just don't care anymore. Like, I just lose and it doesn't matter. I feel nothing. You don't actually have to be there. Like, that doesn't matter. You can have certain emotions, and as long as you can accept them and process them quickly and easily, then it's it's actually very doable to to continue to, to do well. Like, in a relationship, um, maybe people talk about an ideal situation where you and your boyfriend or girlfriend don't fight anymore. Like, we never fight. We just get along all the time perfectly. Well, that's not necessarily a realistic goal. Maybe it is for some people, but it's not for most people. What's more realistic is how you deal with a fight, how quickly you get through it, how self-destructive or, or mutually destructive that fight is. And if you can get through it very easily, hey, I'm upset. I'm upset too. Okay, I need two minutes. All right, we talked it through. We feel better. Then that's a really strong relationship, right? Your mental game is the same way. I got one today. It sucks. I had a cup of coffee, I'm over it. That's a good goal as a place to get to.
Um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit uh, all over the place here, but let's get let's get back on track. So yeah, so when we're when we are talking about stress and processing stress, um, when we have this downswing, we think to ourselves, you know, one, this means something really bad for my bankroll. Like this means that if I keep going this way, I'll go broke. Two. Um, Maybe similar to that, this means something bad for my career. Maybe I'm not a winning player anymore. Maybe the game's got twice as hard overnight. Uh, maybe, I don't know, like I, I've just been running good this whole time for 500,000 hands, and now it's kind of coming to an end. Um, I'm never going to be able to improve from here, and I'm not good enough, and I'm going to fail, right? This is a little bit exaggerated, but people do go through these kinds of thought processes, whether it's with um, poker or with something else. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit. Uh, hopefully I won't get in trouble with my girlfriend. <laughs> she's a lawyer, and she's really good at her job, and she works really, really hard. And every time she has a new case, uh, it's like, I'm going to lose the case, and uh, when I'm going to lose the case, everyone's going to hate me, and then I'm going to get fired from my job, and then we're not going to be able to pay the mortgage, and then, you know, life is, is going to end. And uh, sort of similar to what Spiro said, this is sort of a double-edged sword. Like, it pushes her to work really, really hard, and it's made her do that her whole life. She's always gotten straight A's, she's always gotten scholarships. Um, Spiro says, my most common thought when being uh, in a downswing is winning was just variance. Yeah, me too. That's completely what I feel as well. Um, it's, it's very, very normal, I think. I mean, it's, at least it's the two of us, I, you know. Um, I think a lot of people... Um, not everybody, but a lot of people minimize their successes and they maximize their failures, right? They focus more on their failures than their successes. That's worse with DS that you question yourself. Downswing, yeah, not the losses, I think, yeah. Um, okay, when you win a lot, you're afraid to grab more. Yeah, that definitely happens. I think this has been talked about quite a bit by different people, but uh, a lot of people make the mistake of, uh, you know, the, it's like life advice that's bad for poker. Like, people say quit when you're ahead, right? That's something you hear a lot about gambling. Well, uh, actually, you should maximize the amount of time you play in your A game and minimize the amount of time you play in your B or C game, right? So if you're down a lot, especially, like, live, you might say, I'll play another few orbits. Uh, but then when you're up, you say, well, you know what, I'm tired, I'm going to go home. Right? And And this is actually, you should actually stay longer, play longer when you're doing great. And make it a little shorter when you're doing less well, you know. Um, obviously, like, you might have, like, hand volume targets, and you should just, like, play five hours every day, and it doesn't matter if you're up or down. Um, that's, like, a very professional way to be. But if you're ever going to quit early, quit when you're down. Um, and, and keep playing when you're up. Um, people, yeah, also, uh, this is a little, I'm, again, being tangential, but um, all of the things that we're afraid of, and therefore avoid, right? Like, let's say we're afraid of making big bluffs on the river, or let's say we're afraid of continuing to play, like, a high-stakes game because we're up. So you took a shot at 1K, you won four buy-ins, you've got 5K in front of you, and you're like, I want to quit, because the worst feeling in the world will be if I get stacked four times, and I'm back to even after this amazing shot that I took. Every time you avoid those things, um, you are not getting a chance to confront them. Like, you're not actually training yourself to deal with something uncomfortable. So we'll talk more about this, but um, one of the things I'm going to advocate for is all of the stuff that makes you uncomfortable, whether it's folding, playing when you're up, playing when you're down, managing your tilt in a downswing, whatever it is, all of those things are things you need to do more of, not things you should avoid. Um, do you think someone could keep his A game and still be in the zone after losing seven or eight buy-ins? I'm sure some people like that exist, but I would say it's probably one in a hundred people. Um, guys, uh, I, I'm so sorry. I got I'm really nervous and excited, and I sort of forgot to hit record, but I also rehearsed this yesterday, and when I did, I recorded it. So we'll have half of a, a seminar that's recorded from... Uh, from right now as we speak, and then the first half will have been pre-recorded. <laughs> uh, okay. Thanks for someone for saying that. I, I, this always happens to me. Um, I just, I'm too focused on 
I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, so this is the kind of spiral we go through. Maybe it's not as dramatic for you, but it might look something like this. Maybe it's smaller. Maybe it's just like, I don't want to move back down in stakes. Uh, I'm going to feel like I'm going nowhere if I end up back at 50 and L. Like, I don't know. But um, this is the type of thing where we need to be able to um, properly analyze what the stimulus means rather than relying on our emotional intuition for what that stimulus means. Yeah. Um, this is a poker variance, uh, like, just analysis for uh, someone who wins three big blinds per hundred hands. All right. So, you know, you guys are going to be in downswing uh, stretches for like half of your career if you win 50K, uh, if you win three big blinds per, per hundred hands. Um, or rather, for yeah, every 50,000 hands, it'll be a 50% chance you're in a downswing. Um, you know, if you, uh, yeah, if you if you are uh, tilting after you lose ten buy-ins, then you're going to be tilting seventy five percent of the time, basically, right? So this is uh, this is not good. We need to get really used to this, right? Uh, I, I'm lucky that I play in a softer pool because my swings are are less hard. So I I actually have haven't been forced to do this work as much as some people will if they play um, on, in tougher pools. So, but yeah, like this is, this is uh, what it looks like. One last idea from psychology. Um, most people spend their energy worrying about things they can't control and less about things that they can control. So people will worry that their family member is sick, right? Their family member has some kind of cancer, knock on wood, and uh, they're going to spend a lot of time worrying about that. That's very rational. It's very human, right? But... Uh, it's actually not something that they can control. The worrying doesn't accomplish anything. I'm not saying that we can always stop worrying about something, but it's useful to have this matrix in mind and remember that a lot of our energy gets spent worrying about, say, our downswing. When will this downswing end? When will I be winning again? When will I feel better again? Well, we actually can't control that. We can't control when the downswing ends. So it's much better, we're much better off spending our energy worrying about did I hit 12 hours of studying this week, right? Um, I don't know. Am I making good folds at the table? And if we can put all of our energy into that and none of our energy into, will I get whacked even though I'm taking this shot at, at 1K? Then we're going to be much better off. Um, this is kind of the positivity thing. This is basically just glass half full. Um, is in that order of ideas have goals of EV? No, it's a good idea. Have goals of EV? I'm not sure I understand, Santis. Um, I think maybe you're asking, is, is it good to have a win rate goal? My intuition is no. I think maybe you can have a win rate goal over a year or two years, but not if it's going to uh, tilt you um, when, like, over the course of a week, that goal gets hit a little bit. Um, I think it's you're better off having a goal about how much you know. So, like, my goal is that every time Captain or Captain asks me about a, a hand, um, I'm able to. Uh, my thinking is in line with his. Like, that's just something you have way more control over. So, to me, it feels like a goal where there's less opportunity to tilt um, and 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 get feel sad and whatever. Yeah, yeah, something something where you actually can control it. I think is is better. Um, you can control your win rate over a large enough sample, but it's it's so far in the future that you'll actually have concrete numbers about that. That it's uh, yeah, it, it's not going to serve you well week to week to week. So you you know you're like ah, oh, I'm not meeting my goal. Like I lost twenty buy-ins. Now I'm now I'm one third of my way to my goal. This you know that'll be torture. Um, downswings are an opportunity to get better as a poker player at one of the things that is hardest in the game, right? And uh, an analogy that I, I was thinking of is, imagine that you never actually got to play a three-bet pot. Like you talked about three-bet pots with your coaches, with your friends, you read about them, you watched videos about them, you dreamt about them, you shadow boxed your three-bet pots in the mirror, right? You, you chanted three-bet pot to yourself while you ate your lunch, but you never got to play a three-bet pot. Then one day you wake up and God says, guess what? You're playing a thousand three-bet pots in a row today. 
that would be an opportunity to really pay attention, right? That's where your real training is going to happen. Well, the same is true for downswings. Downswings are an opportunity for you to learn how you feel emotionally, what your limits are in terms of A game and B game, how to manage and tolerate the level of stress you're under, how to you know, proactively recover from each session through journaling and mental game coaching and talking with friends. If you don't treat your downswings as part of your learning in the same way that you treat other types of strategy as part of your learning, then you're not going to improve at dealing with downswings. So treat downswings as an opportunity to learn about yourself and to get better at something that is fundamental to the game. Um, we've talked about this. You have to accept and embrace stress. There's studies that show that people that are okay with the idea of stress like live much longer than people that are afraid of stress. Um, so um, accept stress. Accept that sometimes things suck and sometimes you get owned. You can almost make a joke about it feeling good. Like if someone shows you a bluff and they're a fish, you know, there's a way of feeling good about that. Just like, man, I really, I got whacked today. Um, and uh, if you can be comfortable with the fact that you're, you're stressed, you'll be a lot more okay. It's like pain. Right, like when, when we're little kids, we go to get a shot at the uh, like a flu shot um, or a rabies shot, whatever. And we're when we're little kids, we're really really scared, right? So the shot kind of maybe hurts more than it should, or at least the lead up to the shot is more uncomfortable than it should be because we're just like it's going to be pain. Pain is bad. I don't want to feel pain. I'm scared, right? But when we're older, we're like, yeah, I can accept a little bit of pain. It's a little discomfort. Who cares, right? So the more of that we have. Uh, the better off we're going to be. Pain and stress are natural, positive, um, physiological responses. They are, exist in our body for a reason, and they're non-lethal. They're not a source of danger. So be okay with stress, and you'll, you'll feel better. Um, normal stuff, journal, talk with people, talk with me, ask me questions. Um, you can type your questions at any time. Yeah, we suffer more in imagination than reality. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to working with this group because I studied literature and I feel like a Greek, Greek, Greek group of students will maybe get it more than an American <laughs> group of students if I like mention a poem or something. Sorry, that just felt like a very like, uh, you can put that on a wall. We suffer more in imagination than reality. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, there we go, it's Seneca, great. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is, we're kind of getting near the end here or like the last third of it, um, the unsexy struggle of building habits. There you go. There's Sisyphus for you. Um, the fight is won or lost far away from witnesses behind the lines in the gym and out there on the road long before I dance under those lights. This is Muhammad Ali. Uh, the downswing is not the issue, right? The, the issue is what you're doing in group coaching, what you're doing in your study time. That's where the fight really happens. Fight doesn't really happen at the table. All of the work is really done outside of the table. We spend most of our energy and our focus like trying to maximize at the table, but we should, you know, the game is won and lost maximizing outside of at the tables. Um, so on the subject of habits, this is why I don't tell people, okay, go meditate. Um, Meditating is good for you, blah, blah, blah. Every time I've gone to the dentist since I was a child, the dentist has said, these are the things that are bad that happen if you don't floss. This is how easy flossing is. This is how cheap flossing is. This is why you should floss. And every single time I say, they're completely right. I have no leg to stand on. There's nothing that I can argue against this. I will go floss for sure. And then I never do it. And I never do it because it's just not important to me. I don't, I don't associate it with like any fear of anything bad happening to me. I don't, it doesn't make me feel better as a person. I just have no incentive to go floss. So it never happens, right? The same thing is going to be true if I tell you to go do something. If I tell you to go meditate and you've never meditated before, you might be like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll try it, but I kind of forgot. And also I don't really want to. And, you know, so this is why it's much more important for you to, um, well, we'll talk, we'll talk about this in a second. Yeah, so the obvious stuff is obvious. Get more sleep, don't drink too much coffee, quit all of the drugs that you do, uh, blah, 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 blah. Everybody knows this. Like, you don't need me to tell you this. So uh, why aren't these things happening? Um, 
the most popular model for why these things don't happen is called the transtheoretical model of change. It, it, it states that we have six distinct phases that we are in mentally during a change. Pre-contemplation is basically nothing's happening. Contemplation, we'll use addiction as an example just because addiction is obvious to do. Pre-contemplation, I don't have a drinking problem, everything is fine. Contemplation, maybe this is getting a bit out of hand, maybe I should do something about this. Preparation, okay, how am I actually going to do something about this? I'm going to tell all my friends about this, I'm going to take the alcohol out of my house, I'm going to go to a meeting, whatever. Action, you actually start doing it. You get a lift to the meeting, you've dumped all the alcohol, you have a schedule to replace that activity with, whatever. Maintenance is you just kind of keep doing that, and then relapse or termination or destination. Eventually, often, these things stop. You know, like a less depressing example, the gym. I used to go to the gym all the time. Now I never go to the gym. I'm in, I'm in relapse, right? Uh, so I need to kind of, I'm in, I'm in contemplation now. I keep saying I should go back to the gym, but I actually have to create a plan and execute it to get back into the habit. Um, so, yeah, so people may have this type of, um, of idea for the models of change, like maybe around something like sleep. Maybe you want to have a really good schedule for your poker playing, but you just get distracted every night. Or um, maybe you are worried that um, you, your lack of exercise is impacting your game, but you're not motivated to start working out. So this model of change is relevant because um, your best support, your best bet in mental game coaching is going to be to come to me when you are in the preparation stage or at least the contemplation stage. If you just come to me and say, I just want to be better, right? Uh, I'm not going to be able to, to help you there very much. I mean, I can explore that with you and maybe get you to the contemplation stage, but me telling you to go do something um, is not going to be very helpful. So if you actually want to change something specific about your, your situation, then I encourage you to come to me um, once you're like already prepared to actually make a plan. And you're, you're the only one that can be honest with yourself about that. Um, yeah. Uh, possible goals, avoiding clear tilt, dealing with the stress or anxiety of a downswing as it's happening or before it happens, motivation to study, and health and lifestyle. All of these things are stuff that we can talk about together, we can talk about at the end of today, potentially. Uh, these are reasons why we might be held back. Um, people often say, I'm lazy, I'm not motivated, that's my problem. But just like Phil Helmuth, we have things underlying uh, the reasons that we're different than other people, right? It's abstract to be more motivated or, or less lazy. It doesn't really mean much. It's more about um, these underlying factors that influence motivation that we're not keenly aware of. My partner is is driven by this anxiety, even though she she's much harder working than me. There's this anxiety underneath that that really pushes her. Um, everybody's kind of different in, in the things that are holding them back. Okay, so now we're going to get into group discussion and um, and a, a short exercise. Okay, so I want everybody to... Are we okay? I'm seeing people kind of pop in and out. We're probably good. Uh, so kind of prepare yourself to be ready to push talk in a minute here. Um, first, I'm going to need people to do some writing and just for five minutes, and then maybe some some sharing every man's favorite thing, to share their feelings. Um, okay, so I want you to think about an individual goal. Um, if you want it to be a big goal, that's fine. If you want it to be a small goal, that's fine. But no matter what, I want a deadline, and I want it to be broken down into as many sub-goals as possible. Seven is a good target. Okay, so if you say, I want to study more, that's not specific enough. You want to say, over the next two months, I'm going to do X number of hours of studying, and here are seven steps that are going to go into making that happen. So I want everybody to start doing that for, uh, let's start at five minutes and see if anybody can get anywhere. And then if not, um, and maybe it'll be take home homework, but I'd like to be able to share in five minutes. Does it have to be poker related, Spiros? Uh, no. Because I think that um, your, your life influences your poker and your poker influences your life. So if it's, you know, I don't know, a relationship, you want a relationship to be better, that's actually going to affect your poker. So it doesn't have to be related. Obviously, the gym and stuff affects poker as well. 
I'm a fish on Discord. Yeah. I would I would maybe just ask um if you're coming and going, maybe just pick one. <laughs> like uh, you know. Just I don't I don't know, maybe someone's internet's bad or something. But uh yeah. Okay, so I've set a timer for five minutes. Uh just just try to do this. Try to come up with seven goals or sorry, what one goal with seven sub steps and a deadline. Do this for four more minutes and, and we're only doing it like during the session because I want people to be able to share examples of what they came up with. And then we're going to discuss how it might hold you back or how you might be held back. Just two more, well, two and a half more minutes. Okay, 30 more seconds. Okay. 
Uh, so Sansis has already shared something. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? I encourage uh, using your mic just because I, I want everybody... I would like everyone to build relationships with each other, but it's especially important for me to build a relationship with you, and that kind of happens best through, through voice and as many human components as possible. So if anybody wants to... They can type it as well, though. You can type as well. But just anybody else want to share? Have to be share. I'm not sure. Uh, Santa's with me. Uh, I think there should be a push to talk button. Remote. Yeah, you can unmute like um, yeah from the settings down. So you want us to uh, write down also an end goal, right? Because yeah, I just see like Santans wrote down some uh, bullets here. So, no, so Sant, uh, Santos, uh, sorry, sorry to pick on Santos for a second here. So that, that wasn't exactly what I had in mind. I don't know if I explained it perfectly. Uh, Santos, that's a lot of goals. So you're going to want to focus on one of those goals and then, uh, at least for this exercise and, and break it down into seven sub goals. So for example, if you want to, uh, meditate at least 10 hours per month, then you want to find. Uh, you know, research, like goal one might be to research the forms of meditation. Goal two might be to get access to those forms of meditation. Goal three might be to discuss meditation and coaching. Goal four might to be to make a schedule for meditating. You know, break it down into so many sub goals that it's like impossible not to know what to do next. If you have this many goals, Muay Thai, studying, meditation, it's really tough to accomplish all of them at once. Okay, so I would like to lose around 10 kilograms and be in a better shape. I think that is achievable in a time frame of three months. The goal I have to achieve that are to happen. Hit the gym at least four times per week. Start going to the supermarket. So Spiros, I would also ask yourself when? When in the week? Four times per week when? Like actually make 5 p.m. on Tuesdays I'm going to the gym. Start going to the supermarket more frequently to have ingredients that I can cook. Great. So things like that. We're going to, and this is the stuff we talk about in group coaching, but like where are we going to get these recipes? Um, how are we going to find healthy recipes that you enjoy? Um, okay, healthy cooking blogs, good. Um, don't try to seek this easy solution. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, that's okay. We don't we don't have to worry about un un unmuting. You can you can do this type of stuff um, through the chat. My goal is to play. Nwanda says my goal is to play and study for a combined minimum of forty hours per week. So Nwanda, I think it would be a good idea to be specific about how many hours for each, because you have control over that, right? So you can say to yourself, I'm playing 25 hours and studying 15, or I'm playing 20, studying 20. We're also working out three or four times per week. Cool. Again, when will we have the workouts? Um, so I, the things that I'm just suggesting, I'm coaching here, are being like so specific that you can't fail, right? If you say, I'm going to the gym four times a week, then that doesn't mean you have to go on Mondays. It doesn't mean you have to go on Tuesday either. It doesn't mean you have to go on Wednesday. And then the week is gone and you haven't gone to the gym four times. But if you say, I'm going to the gym at 5 p.m. on Tuesdays and the gym is across the street, then you know when you're failing that goal and you know when you're achieving it. Uh, I, the chat is okay. The chat is, I'll get to know everybody over time. Deadlines, January 1st, identify main leaks, find a way to plug leaks efficiently. Okay. Form a daily study group. Yeah. And then Irmo, I might say something like identify three leaks. Or identify, uh, you know, some, some arbitrary number. Set that as a goal. If you achieve that goal, you can always set a new goal. Right? Um, find a way to plug leaks efficiently. Yeah. I, I don't fault you for that one being vague because that can be a hard thing to know the answer to, but um, you know, get my coach to confirm that three of these leaks have been plugged or something. Form a daily study schedule work on my game. Cool. Good. And that would be more, yeah, like a sub goal. Good. Put in the volume. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Um, great. So these are all examples of things that um, one of the things that mental game coaching can hopefully help you with is that it's it's valuable to be accountable to somebody. You don't have to be accountable because they're going to yell at you or whatever. It's just like it's good to have somebody in your life that knows what you're about, what you're trying to do, right? 
I mean, like, for me, as an example, again, this is not a very related example, but like I said, like, I used to have a problem drinking. All of my friends know that I'm, I'm in recovery. All of my friends know I've been sober five years. Like, that's actually pretty helpful. You know, like, it, not that it's, it's a struggle day to day anymore, but it's nice for everyone to know. So if everybody you know in your life is like, hey, you're supposed to hit the gym four times a week, it's actually going to be easier to get that done. No problem, boss. Um, okay, good. So, yeah, everyone's sharing these goals. Um, another thing you can do is, is think about the person you're closest to in the CFP, whoever you talk with the most. Send them this goal. Workshop it with each other. You can workshop it with me as well, but, you know, troubleshoot it with each other. And then check in with each other. So I'm just saying one of the strategies is to remain accountable to someone besides yourself. That can be me, that can be a friend, that can be someone from the CFP. Remaining accountable can help you get this done. Okay, discussion, we did. Uh, so think about, it as well, this will be homework, but think about the obstacles. If this is so important to you, why hasn't it happened already? That's a key question, right? If this is so important to you, why hasn't it happened already? If you've been thinking about studying more for a year, why haven't you been studying more? The answer beneath that is going to be there's an obstacle. Something emotional, maybe the thought of doing the work, you, you automatically avoid it. You don't have to say, oh, it's because my mother was like this. Just think about what's happening emotionally or practically that's stopping you from doing this. Are you burnt out? Uh, do you avoid it because it makes you anxious? Um, do you have trouble focusing when you study? So think about obstacles. A couple more things, kind of trying to go quick now. Life change, if you have to leave at uh, 12, 12.30 Eastern time, you have to leave, but um, I'll try to get through this as fast as I can. Life changes have the same effects as swings. Uh, things happen in your life. Uh, even things that are positive can create stress. Uh, your brother's getting married. You're getting married. Uh, you, I don't know, you're, you're, you get back in touch with a relative who you had a big fight with before and you're happy about it. I don't know. These, these positive changes in your life, actually, they have a surprisingly amount of, like, negative affect associated with them. You know, some people are so intolerant of success that when they get a big promotion, they deliberately, subconsciously fuck it up. Like, they get themselves fired because they just can't handle the stress of positive change. So any changes in your life are stressful. Um, and you should keep in mind, you should be as aware of yourself as possible about how your life is affecting you and how that could be bleeding into poker. So that's another thing to consider. Um, huge number of people start playing bad because something else is going on. And what's so insidious about it is they're not even aware. They're like, well, poker's going fine, so I don't see why I'd be playing worse. But meanwhile, they had a breakup, it really sucked, and it's affecting everything. Useful habits. Um, Captain talked before about how Helmuth wrote a book on uh, positivity. This is sort of related to that. This is something that I find really, really valuable. I almost should have put it earlier in the presentation. It, this comes from an Olympic athlete who wrote a book. I'm forgetting the guy's name now. I should remember it. But he had this idea called the gap in the game. The gap in the game is people spend most of their energy focused on where they want to be. You know, I'm playing in, uh, I'm playing state football, but I want to play for at the NFL. Or I'm playing 200 NL, but I want to play 500 NL. Or I'm getting better, but I'm still making bad calls on the river. They don't spend enough time thinking about what they've accomplished. If you continuously approach the situation that you're in, thinking about what you've accomplished, with pride for yourself, respect for yourself, and enthusiasm for where you are at, you're going to be in a position to feel like you can tackle anything. Right? If I say, I've gone from 200 NL to 500 NL in six months, what's to stop me from crushing 1K in another six? I'm killing it. Right? You're just going to have way more potential to motivate yourself than if you're like, every time, yeah, I got to 500 NL, but 500 NL is easy. Getting to 1K, that's going to be impossible. They're all killers at 1K. I'm not a killer. If you're negative, uh, things feel difficult. If you're positive, things feel easy. So focus on what you've accomplished. R write this down for yourself. Write down what you've accomplished in poker. And think about it for a second and then write down how it makes you feel. So focus on what you've gained over six months, not what you want to accomplish in six. Of course, both are important, but the gain is going to give you more resilience, more confidence. I'm sorry, Sebastian, to interrupt yeah. you. 
something about what you said. So for me, it was kind of the same. I was playing like two, th- two years ago. I was stuck. I was playing 500 NL. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I couldn't go to 1K. And one day, because I had on 2 plus 2, I used to make, uh, back when I was a face, 2016-15, I, I used to have some, uh, this poker and goal um, blog type of thing. And accidentally, I saw one of my blogs that I was uh, 25 and L, and then I realized the progression. And somehow, yeah. when I realized that, I felt way more in peace, kind of with myself, more calm. And then uh, it, it really helped me. I can send also to the guys here the link because I have two blogs where you can see me literally have 500 on my name on my blog when I was uh, 22 years old. And I was writing down like being happy winning $40 or something. Yeah, totally. Thanks for sharing that, Captain. And I actually remember I saw your blog when we were getting to know each other. And I literally was thinking to myself, man, it would have been so great. I wish I had done that. It would be so awesome to yeah. have this this thing of me at 18 being like, I don't under, you know, I three bet king three suited from the small blind and I got... <laughs> uh, yeah. No, totally. Uh, and for me, I struggled for so long. Like, I really struggled. I'm not the most naturally talented player, but eventually things just clicked. And it's been so nice to, for eight months for things to feel like I'm on the right track where it's all coming together. Um, that gap in the game thing is really, really valuable. Yes, yeah, Spiros, you know, it's interesting. I think actually there are people on both sides of the variance. Uh, some people really, they're just full of themselves, and other people, they really undermine themselves. It's a cultural thing as well. Like, if you're American, maybe you're more likely to, to be positive, and if you're, if you're European, like, you might be more humble. Uh, people, I think, are afraid of being obnoxious, they're afraid of being arrogant, and they're afraid that if they are too happy, they'll be complacent. Um, but I think these are misconceptions. I think that you are actually much better off um, acknowledging and appreciating the things that have gone well for you. Um, it's just gratitude. It's just gratitude for what you've accomplished, right? It's, it's feeling happy and lucky that you've, you've done something that you feel proud of. There's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, check out Captain's blog. I, I really got a, a, it made me smile when I first saw that. And it made me think about my own journey. Um, and, you know, maybe start keeping one for yourself. Okay, so we're finishing up here. I'm not going to go too much into CBT, but CBT is a very, very common strategy in, to help people with everything. Anxiety, depression, probably very helpful for tilt as well. Anger management. Um, it's not my specialty, but it's also not complicated. Uh, if you're interested in CBT, you should look up what it is, and then we can talk about it in mental game coaching if you want. But it's basically something you can teach yourself. It's basically just uh, asking yourself every time you have a, an emotional thought, whether that's based in reality or not. Um, another trick you can try is talking out loud in your sessions. I, I really find this helpful, um, especially when you have like a close decision on the river. If you talk through what's happening, then you're going to be able to identify whether you're making a decision for emotional reasons or based on actual analysis. You know, like if you get to the river with the flush on a paired board and they rip it in and you're getting like 10 to 1 on a call and they're never bluffing, you know, you, you maybe when you click call, you're really just thinking, fuck this. So if you talk through it, you're able to say, okay, am I clicking call? If I was clicking call, I'd be get clicking call because I'm getting 10 to 1. Well, is that a good enough reason? No, he has to be bluffing, um, you know, one out of every 10 times or something in order to click call. Um... Is that really happening? No, I think that it's only one in 10 players who are ever bluffing here. Okay, so then I can't have equity to call. Uh, okay, so new blog coming, or new channel coming with blogs. Time down, good. Yeah, yeah, I've seen people even do that live. They call the clock on themselves. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no worries, everyone. You don't have to share your goals. Just, uh, it's, it's voluntary. Um, I mean, I'm, ter- I'm a station. I'm complete station. It's still something I struggle with so much. And I think it's tied back to this idea of hating to lose. Like, there's this way in my brain, if I get bluffed, they've won, and I've lost. Which is insane. 
because that is not how the game works, right? The game works by making the most money. That's winning. But if in my head, if I get bluffed, I lost and they won. It's like safety. Yeah. Um, other things you can do. We're just wrapping up here. Five more minutes. We start each session mindfully. Uh, start each session with a goal. I'm going to uh, avoid uh, playing my B game for the next two hours. I will avoid overfolding river. I will avoid overcalling river. Just start each session with one goal that you can keep in mind. Don't play my best. It's too comp. It's too vague. Specific goal for each session. Start mindfully with that in mind. Um, obviously, sleeping enough, taking time to unwind. All of these things are important. Here's a hack some of you might not have considered. Make the place that you play your favorite place. Okay. Put in your record player, your posters, really comfy chair, paint the walls. I don't care. Do something to make it your favorite room. This is going to help you win. Okay. Um, it's going to make shitty days feel way more tolerable when it's just your favorite place to be. So some of you, maybe you're younger, maybe you're playing like on a laptop in the living room. Try to figure out a solution to that because um, that's going to help a lot. Be accountable to someone every day. This is a scary idea, but I think it's a good one. Always post the hands that you played the worst. I think if you do that, then you're probably going to start making less puns, right? Because you're accountable. You're accountable to uh, the fact that you did something just because it felt good emotionally. Okay, so now we're done. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to read this out loud or anything, but I, I used to study poetry. I used to write poetry, so I thought I would include a poem that I find inspiring for poker. You can screenshot this if you've seen it before. It's a pretty famous poem. But, uh, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, maybe this will help inspire you. Um, okay. A little bit over time, but I'm here. I've got time. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'd be happy to answer them. I see someone typing, so I'll, I'm going to give see two people typing. As a man thinketh, is that so? Is that the Stoics, Murphinus? You would love as a man thinketh, uh, Murphinus writes. As I'm looking it up. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Alan James. Cool. There's um, and also there's an essay by William James, who's one of the godfathers of psychology on habits. That's a good read for people into that sort of thing. Um, okay, cool. I'll check it out. Thanks, Murphinus. Uh, is there any specific mental leak you've had that you've overcome in your poker career? And if so, how did you overcome it? Irmo asks. I'm going to have to think about that for a minute. I used to, like, when I, when I started uh, in, in 2020, I decided I was going to play 100 Zoom and I was just going to win because I'm insane. Like, I had no coaches. I, had, I didn't have a solver. I didn't know what I was doing. I just thought... I don't know. It was an insane idea. I got absolutely whacked. And in doing that, I would just tilt all the time. Like, I just, you know. And um, I think I was tilting all the time, not because I was getting unlucky, but because in my heart of hearts, I felt that I was failing. And uh, I think things largely turned around for me when my sample got large enough and was winning enough that I did not tie downswings to my success. Um, so I think that's the, the best answer I can give for how I've largely dealt with tilt. Um, I think now, for me, it's more about focus and sometimes making some entitlement calls on the river. Like, you know, some fish has top boat for sure every time and you call middle boat. Um, that's still tough for me. 
uh, which is kind of unacceptable for someone taking shots at 1k, frankly. But yeah, so I'm, I'm there too. Mistake tilt. Biggest leak is mistake tilt. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, one thing I think, uh, actually in general, so a lot of people do things, like fish especially do things, because they're really afraid to make mistakes, right? Right, Captain? So, like, you'll see a fish, uh, like, shove the flop with queens, because they're like, I don't know, what if the turn's a 10, and then I don't know what to do, and, like, yeah, just get all the money in, because once the money's in, the hand is over, and I don't have to think anymore, and if I don't have to think anymore, I can't make a mistake. Right? Even I do this, like, if I'm out of position, I'm like, this is a really thin shove for value. I'm not even sure that it's good, but if I check and I face a shove, my life is hell. So I'll just shove and make my life easier, right? This is because we're afraid of making a mistake. When you make a mistake, you're kind of just getting unlucky, right? Like, when two people play chess, there's one person that's objectively better than the other person. They can measure this numerically. Right? Someone has an ELO of 1300 and someone has an ELO of 1500 and they play, the guy with 1500 ELO is better. But the guy with 1500 ELO does not always win. So how do we describe that phenomenon of him not winning? Do we say that the 1300 player is better? Well, no. I mean, they've played, they've played so many hundreds of thousands of games, we know that the player that's 1500 is better than the 1300 player. What happened is he made more mistakes than he usually does. So he got a bit unlucky. Making mistakes is always going to happen. No matter how good you are, it's just going to be different what you call a mistake. And so you have to be as comfortable with mistakes as you are with getting unlucky, because they are the same thing. That's one way I would consider thinking about it. Yeah. And, and similarly, like uh, for players more like me, probably not so much captain, but in general, embrace the spots where you will make mistakes. Because actually, what separates you from other players is how well you perform in the spots where mistakes can be made. Nobody can make a mistake when they have aces preflop, right? Well, I mean, I don't know, sizing mistakes or something. But uh, when you are in a really close spot, that's where the real money is. That's what separates a 200 NL player from a 1K player, is the close spots. So don't avoid them. Embrace them. Take, treat them as a learning opportunity. And be, be sick about it. Be prepared to be wrong. Like, that's, that's really important. When you make a decision, you instantly know it wasn't the highest EV decision, then you get angry to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, this is the type of thing that's going to vary from person to person. And it's a good example of how, you know, my approach is to tailor things um, more towards the individual. Um, in terms of what kind of stories telling yourself will make it feel easier, uh, what it actually feels like for you to make a mistake. Like, okay, just to be, just an example, like maybe when you made mistakes as a kid, uh, you got yelled at, or like you were told that you were not a very good kid or something. That's going to be a different person and a different story than someone who, I don't know, just feels like they they've told themselves a story that they never make mistakes and that they're perfect or something. Like, all these people are different. Um, but yeah, I think, I think just embrace it as part of variance. Mistakes are part of variance. And, uh, and getting better in tough spots is good. If two spots are equal EV, you should actually take the tougher spot. Like, if uh, checking and facing a bet is like the same EV as shoving, you should check and face the bat because you're actually going to improve. Uh, thinking a lot of my mistakes, even after the hand, it sticks in my head. This happened to a degree that I even closed sessions sometimes because I guess regardless of the result of the session. Yeah, so you're fixated on the mistake. Um, yeah, I think, um, like makes you improve. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I think one, I'll, sometimes things are easier said than done. Right. And so for, I think captain, you probably already know 
that you're supposed to let go of the hand and focus on the present, but it's still difficult for you. So in one-on-one -on -one coaching with somebody like that, I would be trying to figure out what the obstacles are to them refocusing on the present moment and what kind of a plan we can make to make that happen. Um, so it would be kind of a two-way street, but like one example of a suggestion might be something like, if you can make a habit of, of, of um, always tagging the hand that happens and always reviewing it immediately after the session, then maybe it will give you permission to let go of it more easily. Because you know, okay, this is actually happening right away. Like, I'm actually going to be talking about this hand in one hour, two hours um, with myself, sending it to my colleague, and that might give you more permission. Um, and that might not work. And then we would talk about a different solution. And so that's kind of where uh, it can get a bit tricky. Because um, psychology is not, like, there's no, there's no silver bullet. It's, um, it's just trying to figure out who you are as a person, and what works best for you. Sometimes trial and error, and sometimes insight, self-insight. Um, but yeah, that's one suggestion to start. Just tag the hand immediately, and then make a habit immediately after I review this hand. Um, you can also, like, yeah, no problem. Uh, another thing, like, I do, I, maybe other people do this too, but, like, after I have a really tough session, I treat myself. Like, I, I get a really nice non-alcoholic beer from the local brewery. I put them in the fridge. I've lost 10 buy-ins. It's like, all right, time to lie on the couch with my cat and have this non-alcoholic beer and feel, feel really good about life, right? So that's, like, that's something else you can do. You might feel like punishing yourself, but of course, you, that would be ridiculous because you have no control over a bad beat. So, um, you know, just like subconsciously... Set up, imagine there's two of you, like one of you is sort of your mother somehow, and one of you is you. Set up little things in your life that are like the opposite of traps. There are things that you fall into that make your life better. Just, oh yeah, I put this amazing drink in the fridge and I always have it after a bad beat. Oh yeah, like after I have a losing session, I always review the hands while listening to my favorite album. Uh, you know, these types of habits are really going to help life be more palatable. Um, again, I have time, but I also, I understand that we're over time, so unless, unless Captain says otherwise, I think, you know, now if you have to be somewhere or anything, just feel, feel free to, to jet. Um, I think something that would help most students is having stop loss to the session, because sometimes ego comes over and you think you can play a game, but you don't. Yeah, no, totally. I think, um, I had a coach once who told me, like, he doesn't really like stop losses, because the ultimate goal of being a professional is that you, you really have, like, a almost never-ending stop-loss. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I agree with that piece of advice. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty natural and common to have a stop-loss. In general, you're better off playing more if you're, when you're winning and less when you're losing. Yeah, like, I guess one of the problems with stop-losses is just, and everybody is going to be different again, but if you're at a really profitable table and you're playing your B game or your C game, it's still possibly a better spot than a normal table where you're playing your A game, right? So it would be really nice if you shot take a 1k table with one massive whale to be able to lose two buy-ins and keep going. Um, but everybody's different, and especially if you're the type of player who does something stop one hour and then get back again. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think maybe most people err on the opposite side of what Captain is suggesting. Like, I will, I have been guilty before of continuing to play at a table that was pretty good, and I told myself I should keep playing, but it was late, I was tired, I was frustrated, and, like, honestly, the hourly was not worth it in the end. I The EV would have been 50 an hour. I just, better off getting back to it tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. I, th I, think, it, I think it's individual. Um, but it's a good thing to discuss. Ask what works for other people. Try to visualize that for yourself. See how that feels. Yeah. Shorter sense, uh, sessions, mental rest. I heard Uwe Pelig say that uh, when you are in a downswing that's really bad, you're like an injured athlete. 
And injured athletes, they don't work extra hard when they're injured, right? They take time off and they recover. I like that analogy. Um, it's okay to take time off. Like you, you guys all have, or at least should have, other things in your life that deserve energy and attention, right? So if you are just totally not enjoying yourself, it can be really productive to take 24 hours. Yuri Pelik's a poet? Are you, are you just saying, like, he, he's good with words, or is he literally a poet? If he's literally a poet, that just made my day. Okay. Because I love poetry. I'm like, it's a lot of... Yeah, yeah, it's a very good analogy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think uh, stop-loss stuff is, is very individual. But breaks, breaks are good. There are a, a couple people that I've talked to recently that one thing I worry about for them is burnout. Burnout's very real. When you're very driven, you say, I'm going to study 490 hours a day, and I'm going to work out, and I'm going to see eight people. Um, you can probably do this for three months, but then one day you're going to be like, I, I can't move. Like, I literally... So be careful. Know your own limits that way. Yeah. It's not, I don't think it's really worth it. It's not really the most efficient way of doing things. Like, if you imagine you said to yourself, well, to be productive, I'm just not going to sleep for a week. And then I'll sleep after. That's not a very good strategy, right? So it's better to take breaks and live a, a more balanced life, I think. Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm really glad that we've had, like, this has been a, a really engaged group and a good discussion. I can tell people are starting to think about what these things mean for themselves. They're starting to plan what kind of obstacles they might have. They're starting to think about how their tilt manifests, why they might have that kind of tilt. Everybody here seems like they are locked in to the right directions when it comes to mental game. Um, I think maybe we'll leave off somewhere around here. But um, Captain, not to put you too much on the spot, and sorry if, sorry if this is doing that, I was wondering if um, the first student I met with I think was not sure what the um, the future of of one on one coaching might look like. So, if it's possible, do you think I should have maybe asked you to, to, uh, before the this started? But would it be possible no, to, fine, mention, yeah, yeah. to mention? Yeah, to mention Yeah, I think like. we did one time now one on one with Nikos. Mm -hmm. He's in the mm -hmm. chat now, uh, and the plan is to make one on one uh, individually at some point with every student. Mm -hmm. uh, for like a first session and then according to what you think they have to work uh, there are going to be like future sessions as well but it's kind of individual what someone someone will have a problem into mistake till for example someone else into bad bits or something so you kind of have to work separate with each individual according to what you are going to make it's kind of leak finder the first yeah. session which you will make uh with everyone Sure. Okay, cool. So yeah, so everybody, I, I think about these things for when we have our first uh, session sometime in the near future. Um, think about what goals you want to accomplish, why you want to accomplish them, what's been in the yeah, way of those but things. Like everyone will have uh, soon, like at the next weeks, they are all going to have one on one with you. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'm really excited for that. Um, I, I'm, I can see that there's a lot of thoughtful people in the chat. And uh, yeah, enjoyed it so far. Um, yeah, okay. All right, thanks a lot, you guys. GG, sir. Good game. Uh, yeah, I really I look forward to it. All right. Take care for now, everybody.